Ant-Man is here. It's the kickoff to Phase 5 and the introduction of the next Thanos-level threat. It's the highly anticipated beginning that is supposed to culminate with the giant multiversal battle, including all of the MCU characters, in addition to some pre-MCU favorites like Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man and Hugh Jackman's Wolverine. It absolutely crushed its first week at the box office, and then... It was beat at the box office in its second weekend by a movie about a bear eating a bunch of cocaine and going on a killing spree in the woods. But this isn't the first time that Marvel has fallen recently, as Phase 4 got bombarded with negative reviews. So what happened? Why is the quality of the MCU taking an absolute nosedive? On my films, I try to shoot as much in camera as possible. There's nothing more dispiriting than when you turn off the work and there's just a green screen with a couple of actors in front of it. It's really, the magic's not there. Filmmakers started using CGI in the 70s, but it wasn't until the 90s that it started to really take off. But even then, it was just a supplement to practical effects, not a crutch. But because it opened the door for many new possibilities, filmmakers around the turn of the century gave in to temptation and overused CGI to the point where they railroaded their own films. Just look at Die Another Day. Marvel films always used a healthy dose of CGI, and for example, out of 2,700 shots in Avengers Infinity War, only 80 didn't feature any visual effects. But recently it's gotten so out of control that the VFX teams have openly complained about being overworked. Even the director and one of the co-stars of Thor 4 criticized the CGI in their own movie. Okay. Does that look real? In that particular shot, no, actually. <laughs> it did. Audiences like worlds that they can get invested in. Ones with a good mix of familiarity and fantasy, like Hogwarts, Middle Earth, or Narnia. But CGI saves studios the hassle of building immaculate set pieces and risking injuries to actors and stuntmen, which can potentially save money, but we're gonna get back to that point. Top Gun Maverick got almost universally positive reviews and became one of the highest grossing films of all time despite being banned in China. A big part of this was that audiences appreciated their efforts to capture as much in camera as possible. It's very important to me that it be practical, that we actually put the camera right in there and shoot the sequences for real. That was the aim, that was always the goal, and I said I'm not going to make this film unless we can accomplish that. To put today's CGI use in perspective, 2015's Jurassic World used over 30 times the amount of CGI as 1993's Jurassic Park, and the 1991 film Terminator 2 only used CGI in 42 shots, compared to the 1900 CGI shots done in 2019's Terminator Dark Fate. Somehow, the films done in the early 90s with much less CGI actually looked more realistic. This is because they used to rely on practical effects, and set pieces had to be built. Take 1995's Batman Forever. It took nine months to build all of the sets and props, but the final result was an immaculate and unique looking Gotham City. Compare that to some of the MCU backdrops that we see today. Every day was fun. It was just, it's crazy, but also it's, it's such a spectacle. Every set was amazing. Just when you thought after, I don't know, a month or two in Gotham City, you figure you've seen everything and then there'd be the circus scene or something else. It was extraordinary. The overuse of green screen is kind of like the modern version of how Westerns used to reuse sets, as old Tucson in Arizona was used in over 500 movies. With CGI, it's much easier to make changes and extensive reshoots can be avoided. Therefore, lots of time can be saved, and films can be pumped out in an assembly line like fashion. Again, like they did with the Westerns. This doesn't really save money though, as the budgets for MCU movies typically fall between 170 and 250 million. If you take Independence Day, which was one of the biggest films in the 90s, it wouldn't even be 150 million adjusted for inflation. This movie was accomplished using mostly miniatures. Roll camera, please. Hey! Hey! And action! There have been some really good MCU films, like Avengers Infinity Wars mentioned before, that have used a ton of CGI, so that's definitely not the only problem plaguing the MCU. 
Disney is trying to cast a wide net to appeal to many different audiences, and because of this, it's making some of the same mistakes that the Batman films of the 90s did when trying to accomplish the same goal. Luckily, the first movie, I never heard the word franchise. That sort of developed over the, right, the last yeah. couple of years, you know, and it just gets more and more away from making a film. And, well, you know, I, it, these studios become like these big corporations, and you're yeah. having to, like, design characters for Happy Meals before you design them for oh. the film, you know? The Batman film started off dark and gritty, but toy sales were lagging because Tim Burton's films were scaring children. The studio was heavily pressured by McDonald's to fire Tim Burton and lighten up the tone to cater more to kids. This strategy ended up driving the franchise off of a cliff when they made one of the worst comic book movies in history. Seven million. Never leave the cave without it. Superhero films of the 80s and 90s were usually pretty campy, with some exceptions like The Rocketeer and The Phantom, and it wasn't until 2000 that X-Men changed the game with a new formula. Action. The big thing that Brian really talked about from the beginning was that he didn't want to have our characters portrayed in the way that they had been traditionally in comic book adaptations where everything was glossy and sort of this hyper-realism. He wanted us to be real people with real human problems and flaws who happened to have other powers. Marvel went bankrupt in 1996, so they hastily sold off the movie rights to many of their properties so they could avoid going under. They regained the rights to Iron Man in 2005 after New Line declined to make that movie, which would have supposedly starred Tom Cruise. They took a grounded approach and portrayed a flawed hero trying to grapple with his role in the military-industrial complex. It is fun to ground these characters, to keep them as relatable as possible to our audience, while still maintaining the fact that Tony Stark is a genius that builds an iron suit that can fly around, and Steve Rogers was frozen in ice for decades, and Thor comes from another planet. Um, but all of them are human and have flaws and have characteristics that we can see ourselves in on that stage. At their best, MCU movies were based around relevant topics, like the theme of the deep state in Captain America the Winter Soldier, the theme of nationalism versus globalism in Black Panther, and the ongoing freedom versus security debate between Steve Rogers and Tony Stark. We're all a product of our time. I don't think we set out to make any overt political statements in our movies, but we're influenced by the world around us as we're sitting in a room developing the stories and creating the stories. The MCU films had jokes, but they were mostly grounded in the beginning. But much like the Batman films, Disney makes a lot of money outside of the cinema. They sell toys and theme park tickets for 12 locations worldwide. Also, there is now an entire generation of teenagers that have only known a cinema where the MCU dominates. I met a kid I'd never met before at a, at a party the other day. But, you know, he's talking about how he saw the first Iron Man when he was four or five. Right. So, to him, Marvel movies and DC movies are movies. Right. And there's been actually almost no competition to show him that there can be anything else. Disney's attempt to appeal to the largest audience possible has resulted in films with wildly inconsistent tones. Take a movie like Black Widow. This had a dark intro portraying Natasha's story as an allegory for human trafficking, but ended up deviating into a run-of-the-mill CGI fest with immature humor peppered in. The Hulk films are another example. They started out as a serious character study about a scientist who was burdened with what he saw as a curse, and was desperately trying to cure himself so he could be with the woman that he loved. And then, it turned into this. It even made a joke of a once intimidating villain. But it actually gets worse. He almost tasted that. Num 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 num, eat it up. Go play OK321. You know I'm the hottest. You ain't never gotta heat me up. I'm oh, you are way more fun than my last lawyer. I will kill for you, Megan Thee Stallion. Prior to Phase 4, Marvel had taken its time developing its characters over the course of a decade, only to bring them together in one of the most epic scenes in cinematic history. <laughs> But it's like many things. Once a product captures the market, the quality starts to rapidly decline. What we're gonna do is this. First we pitch them Disney, AT&T, IBM, blue chip stocks exclusively. Companies these people know. Once we've suckered them in, we unload the dog shit, the pink sheets, the penny stocks, where we make the money. 
There's a major lack of character development, and oftentimes new characters get random powers or abilities that are either unexplained or not really plausible. Like Ant-Man's teenage daughter who somehow learns to teleport people in and out of the quantum realm in a matter of seconds. Or the fact that Thor can just give his powers to whoever he wants whenever the plot calls for it. Other times, the powers are explained away in a cringeworthy fashion. Well, here's the thing, Bruce. I'm great at controlling my anger. Mm. I do it all the time. When I'm catcalled in the street, when incompetent men explain my own area of expertise to me, I do it pretty much every day because if I don't, I will get called emotional or difficult or might just literally get murdered. So I'm an expert at controlling my anger because I do it infinitely more than you. The elephant in the room is that Marvel now uses characters as vehicles to push a message, which was made obvious with almost all of the top male characters being replaced or matched by a female character. There's absolutely nothing wrong with badass female characters or inclusivity, but when it's organic. Disney is a huge corporation, and corporations like this want positive PR, so it's not surprising to see them strongly erring on the side of caution to avoid getting cancelled. But overtly pandering to social issues of the time is not the philosophy that Stan Lee had. Social issues I try to get in, in the background or underlaying a plot, but never to the point of letting it interfere with the story or hitting the reader over the head. Another audience that Disney needs to cater to is the Chinese audience. Over the past 40 years, China has pulled hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, which means that there is now a massive consumer base to watch films in the cinema. For almost 20 years, China only allowed 10 foreign films to its cinema each year, until it raised that quota to 34 in 2012. The Chinese market now makes up a significant percentage of the box office market share, and has the ability to earn films an extra couple hundred million dollars. It has even saved some movies that were flops domestically, like Pacific Rim and a couple of the Transformers movies. This emergence of the Chinese market meant that studios were incentivized to shift their focus to blockbusters, with an appeal to a wide variety of audiences, and genres such as mid-budget comedies and sports dramas that are tough sells abroad were largely diminished. But China wasn't the only reason for this shift in the film market. The DVD was a huge part of our business, of our revenue stream, and technology has just made that uh, obsolete. And so the movies that, that we used to make, you could afford to not make all of your money when it played in the theater because you knew you had the DVD coming behind the release and six months later you'd get all, you know, a whole nother chunk. It would be like reopening the movie almost. And when that went away, that changed the type of movies that we could make. The demise of the VHS and DVD markets due to streaming created a market either for blockbusters that could clean up in theaters or niche indie films that would bring new audiences to streaming platforms. While there are some outliers like Dark Phoenix, there is a correlation between budget and box office numbers, so studios wanted to spend big, but they mostly wanted to invest in proven concepts, which meant that reboots, endless sequels, and Marvel films were hot commodities. When you adjust for inflation, box office sales have been basically stagnant since 2002. The difference is that the market today is more concentrated on superhero films. In 2022, five of the top ten films by box office gross were superhero films. In 2006, only two were. In 2022, the 50th highest grossing film made a bit over $22 million domestically, but in 2006, the 142nd highest grossing film made the same amount adjusted for inflation. To get frustrated when you like uh, make like kind of uh, regular normal movies, you know, and then all these superhero movies like kind of outgross you by 10, you know, then you get like um, upset. But um, that's just what the audience uh, wants to see these days, and you have to accept that. Between the focus on foreign markets and the demise of the VHS and DVD, much of the competition has been driven away, clearing the path for Marvel to continue running the table at the box office. But the film market has been at a similar crossroads before, and if Marvel continues to let their quality slip, good art will emerge and replace it. Studios. You're talking about corporations, you're talking about corporations that are so big and so, it's phenomenal, it's, it's almost, um, uh, the amount of money to be made is so huge that when there's more money to be made, less risk, 
less risk has to be taken. Well, they need that's to the have problem. they need to have results for their shareholders. Where every quarter they can't yeah. they can't movie business is not Coca Cola does not exist on a standard product that you just widen. You, you still depend on artistry, and uh, and this 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 flies in the face of the way modern corporations are run. Hollywood movies of the 1920s were considered obscene by the Catholic Church, so they wrote the Motion Picture Production Code, informally called the Hayes Code, which was a set of moral guidelines for movies. This put American films at a competitive disadvantage against films coming out of places like France or Japan, which were both experiencing a new wave. It wasn't until a 1952 Supreme Court case that these codes were taken down, and they were completely phased out by 1968. This opened the door to films like The Godfather, The Exorcist, and Scarface, which could have never been made 15 years prior. We have censorship today, but it's self-censorship, and instead of the Catholic Church being the reason for this censorship, it is the result of corporations sanitizing their content for the Church of Woke and the Chinese Communist Party. If Disney makes a movie that offends the Chinese authorities, it's not just that movie that might be lost, but also theme park plans, consumer products plans. I mean, there's billions of dollars on the line for any of these relatively small infractions. Over the course of the 1950s, televisions in the house became ubiquitous, so the numbers at the cinema plummeted to the point where some major studios were going broke. This had a similar effect as streaming in the sense that expensive films with an unproven concept became more of a financial risk to studios. What ended up happening was that the studios became desperate and started financing low-budget, gritty, slice-of-life films like Easy Rider and American Graffiti that went on to make tons of money and win Academy Awards. New Hollywood, as this was called, lasted throughout the 70s and led to the creation of some of the most iconic filmmakers and franchises that the world has ever known. You know, everybody's like kind of really afraid right now because everybody says like, oh my God, when the when the superhero movie is not working anymore, the franchise movie not working anymore, what we do then? And they have probably forgotten how to make original movies. <laughs> but um, Hollywood is very re re resilient and uh, because of that they will come up with something. Eventually Marvel will have to make better films if it wants to survive because the self-censorship won't last forever and film financiers in other countries will take chances on unproven concepts. Just look at South Korea. In the late 60s, increased competition led to two of the best westerns that had ever been created with The Good, The Bad and The Ugly and Once Upon a Time in the West. Maybe less films like Ant-Man, Quantumania, Thor, Love and Thunder and The Eternals can be made and more films like Joker, Logan and Kingsman can be made instead. And hopefully, we can take back the art from the business.